Hi, everyone. Sorry I'm late. I um, just had a meeting with the uh, new chief of em Environment, Energy, and Open Space, and that was in City Hall, and it, it ran long, so I had to run <laughs> to get here, to get to my office. Um, but I appreciate you guys being patient. We'll put the agenda in the, uh, in the chat, sorry. And I will also put the, or did you guys get a chance to review? I know I sent it just this morning, but did you guys get a chance to review the, the meeting minutes? Uh, I did. Yes. How did they look? Well, it said I was there, but I wasn't oh. actually. <laughs> there you go. Otherwise, okay. they look great. All right. So I will make sure that I update that. That don't worry. That's been happening with me. The little details are the, are what's getting me. Um. All right. So that's um. That's the, the agenda. If you guys are okay with the um, minutes, otherwise, you know, just give me a thumbs up, and I will um go ahead and edit the <laughs> the attendance, and then I'll post it. Um, all right, great. So um, I did want to say, I did want to mention that, you know, I did just meet with the, the new chief and we talked about the commemoration commission and the issues we've been having and, you know, some of the, some of the goals that, you know, we want to accomplish. So I have homework and I th think it aligns with the homework that I have anyway, in terms of the six month report. Um, you know, so he he would like to know the challenges, the, fund the question, fundamental questions we, we want to resolve, um, you know, uh, vision we have, expectations, things that we were planning to talk about, I think, anyway, um, in the larger commission meeting coming up. Um, and, you know, questions about how to support um, the commission as best as he can, as best as we can and if there needs to be restructuring or rethinking of the ordinance or anything that you know to make this easier for us you know that's that's something that we had that's what we just discussed um so i think i am meeting with each subcommittee to get each subcommittee's point of view when i do this report um so i think it'll be an important part of this process um i was waiting to meet with you guys um, and get all your notes, and then I'll start writing this report. Um, and then I'll try to send you guys the first draft by the end of the week, um, if everything goes well. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I did want to start with the um, Article 80 discussion uh, debrief, if there were anything, any comments, any questions, any anything that you guys um, had after that uh, that meeting. I know that then and and Allison, you weren't there, so I'm gonna post that. That should be on. It'll be on our the YouTube playlist later today, so you can review it more in depth if you want to later. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to open open up the discussion about it. Um, talk about if there's anything that we weren't able to discuss, anything that we think we should discuss, um, and bring back to them. I wanted to open that. that um, up. just a question, but just from my reading of the minutes. I got the impression that the discussion was about how preservation. I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can you guys hear her? And she's and she's coming in clear for happening? me. Okay. Uh, One second. Sorry. Um, my impression was that the conversation was about how preservation, or if it could be incorporated somehow into Article eighty five or Article eighty, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, you know how far that went or if it was deemed feasible sorry i had to take out my my um headset just to just be able to hear you and know what's going on there um okay yeah it was talked about um a bit and i think that the um the recording will go into it a bit more but um you know uh chelsea asked if Article 80 is an appropriate place for, or an appropriate phase to begin to talk about historical significance um, and what the procedure for that would be. And they said that the revised process is supposed to think about that and include historic preservation much earlier 
um, but that the procedure with which they're doing that is being workshopped, especially because, you know, um, Amanda asked how that new process would layer in with what's already existing um, and what changes would that include to like uh, IAGs because they're calling them community advisory something, teams, teams. <laughs> Um, and they said that it would take something like PNFs and expand it by breaking down each part of the process piece by piece by piece, whilst making that not while scaling it down. So that's not a it's not a massive, a much more massive undertaking than Article eighty already is. Um, you know, she said. Uh, Newport, this Newport. She said that for the community advisory teams, the intent is for residents to represent a majority of the new groups, but they do not know who the who will be responsible for the selection process, um, and that they won't have veto power or con or census requirements, but because they're still advisory. But um, but yeah, I think and Allison asked. Um, hi, Allison. Um, you know, she's asked about city, the city organizational seats from, what's it, from, you know, like a historical, like a historical study, for example. Um, and they said that this is something to consider. Yes, Allison. Um, thanks for that. I, 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 yeah, I read through the minutes. I did have some questions as well. Um, because I, I think I've seen a probably a similar presentation from the poor and some of the other staff members. I've had a one-on-one -on -one call with them. And I, I brought this up with my call with Brian Sweat, uh, mm -hmm. the new, new chief, too. Um, so my advocacy, just so everybody knows where, where the alliance has been, um, I, I do think it's really critical that we infuse the entire process with historic preservation considerations. I have talked a lot about, you know, in Article 85, which is our only other tool outside of landmarking for preservation, we have to determine that it, that it there's a significance that there's a certain bar to cross. And I feel like that whether or not we keep a building um, is, is much more than just whether or not it meets that historic um, bar, that threshold. It's, there's environmental reasons to, to reuse a building. There's affordability reasons to reuse a building, community vibrancy reasons. Um, so I think that Article 80 should be considering reuse the very beginning of the process not just for historic preservation purposes, but for all of these other purposes. So that's what I've really been pushing for. I told Brian about the CARE tool for embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's really important that the public has all the information about what happens to a building when it's demolished. Is it going to a landfill? We need to be reusing these materials. So how do we start to build up the infrastructure for a deconstruction and salvage program in Boston? We talked about that a little bit. Um, so I don't know how much of any of this you guys got into. I, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Um, but I, that's I've, I'm continuing to push on these things through Article 80 and through some of the other conversations like design vision and plan downtown. Um, but I did have a question because when I talked to them, it's been a, a while back now, for the cat, they floated the idea that the cats might be like geographically based, like by neighborhood or area, mm -hmm. but that it could also be thematic so that they said we could have a, preser a historic preservation cat with historic preservation, you know, professionals and advocates that could weigh in on different projects that impact historic resources. I thought that was intriguing. Did that come up at all? Mm -hmm. No. No. Um, Is that something did... we would want to push for? I, I don't really know exactly how it's going to work. I don't know if they do yet either. They don't. Um, if they're if they're going to have, they, they all they said was they're going to have expertise relevant expertise on these cats. And so I want to either make sure there's a mandatory preservation voice on each cat or that we have a preservation cat that can weigh in on projects that we feel is, you know, impacts historic resources, but. Yes, yeah. I agree. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, they didn't, they didn't touch on the historic preservation cat. They did touch on like regional, like each neighborhood. And I think that's, the point that's why Allison brought up the point of having um you know community stakeholders like Hyde Park Historical Society for example um like historic yeah. preservation community stakeholders um but it's it's tricky to say because their process doesn't seem to be that fleshed out um so that's the time when we need to get in there because once they've yeah. made decisions it's hard for them to backtrack so we need Actually, to be really yeah. vocal advocates all along these stages 
Hennessy, no, whose who's responsibility is that? Who's driving these cats? Um, I'm, I am not sure. I know that um, Nupur and, and Kevin are taking the at least communication aspect of it, but I would have to say whoever's um, steering at the Article 80 modernization group uh, would also be part of that conversation. Yeah, I think the thing that's most concerning is that it's not that fleshed out. And so it sounds, you know, like the way of thinking sounds better. But until we actually know the details or until we help flesh out those details, it's, you know, that could be a real concern. Like the whole cat thing sounds good, but it's also not, you know, how do we know that's really going to be different? <laughs> um, it's not really clear like so the, you know they're not clear yet who gets to pick who's in the cat mm -hmm. and you know that's currently a problem like sometimes they have really good IAGs other times they're totally stacked by developers and it's a very non-transparent process so unless yeah I, I think that's that all all of those things we need to push for a very clear and transparent process and then you know that yeah that historic preservation is is up front and integrated into the thinking and i really feel like um you know i was also recently called into a meeting about anti-displacement policy um and you know that there's a really important connection between anti-displacement and historic preservation as well you know so maybe within the anti-displacement policy team they should also be thinking about you know how that connects you know, with the historic preservation, um, you know, thinking about Article 85 and also the whole no. kind of demolition by neglect problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. thanks. I'm all right. Thank oh. you. Sorry. Um, Hyde Park Historical Society, is this the break again? If you have your hand up, you want to speak? Yeah, hi. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, just a quick, obs Frank O'Brien here. Yeah, just a quick observation on, on some of these threads. The one takeaway for me from the presentation by the BPDA folks was that the, if I understood it correctly, was that they're going to release a plan and which, which will presumably address a lot of these questions. My one input to the group and perhaps separately to BPDA is they should release a draft plan for comment. Mm -hmm. Not a fait accompli plan, because historically, a lot of what issues from the BPDA has not been sort of forward thinking as much as we would like it to be. And just for the BPDA to release a, a plan and say we're done might not be the iterative kind of input step that, that would be useful for finalizing some of these really important concerns. Well, would it be helpful for this group to send um, some bulleted feedback or suggestions like in, in this moment of their process so that we have it in writing of what we're recommending? Mm -hmm. Even if it's less concrete, it's more of a, we want to make sure there's a preservation voice on the cats. You know, here's some ideas of how you might do that. Is that mm -hmm. something that this group wants to do? I, I think it would make sense. I think the the fact that they're so amorphous is a good thing, but it's unhelpful because it's hard to know exactly where to where to um butt in. But I think that if we you know write down our concern concerns, write down what we think might work, um, they can they can include that. Like they need they need that kind of process and, and discussion. We might, and if we do that, we could invite them back to discuss it. Um, I I think that. Frank raises a great point of having it be a draft thing, um, having planning do drafts so that it's an iterative process that has the capacity for feedback. Um, so that way they can't be like, well, you know, and there is an accountability there for them um, every step of the way. So I, I do agree. I think it would be a good idea um, to tell them this now, um, sooner rather than later, and, and see what we can continue to meet them. Well, Hennessy, um, since I wasn't at that meeting, I don't know that I'm the right person to to draft something. Um, no, would you be okay. able to 
put some bullets together that, that we can all respond to? Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So if we want, we can move along to the six month report discussion. Um, I'm gonna. Pull well, up. just sorry, just one second, Z. Amanda, I saw you come off. Did you have? Did yeah. You want, like, before we yeah, I can't figure out oh, how to raise my hand, so I was like, <laughs> that. I think my oh, something disappeared on my end, but you know, I'm, I, I'm like trying to process and frame my thoughts while still being respectful of the process. But, you know, I've served on a couple of IAGs at this point, gone through Plan Charlestown. And, you know, to me, the experience is a lot of talking and there's a lot of meetings. And there's also a lot of sense of not feeling effective or heard. Um, so I think that's the real conversation that we should be having is, you know, how can these cats, because to me, it just sounds like rebranding the IAG, you know, with some distractions, you know? Um, so how can we make these more effective? You know, I don't want to see just more, you know, meetings and more people brought in when, at the end of the day, it doesn't feel like, you know, that that avenue is um, of an effective resource of, of time and contributions. So I'm not sure how to say that, you know, diplomatically, politically, where it actually gets, you know, sort of incorporated, but um, maybe you can be more articulate than me. So yeah. Amanda, I, I mean, I agree. I think we've all wasted time or felt like we wasted time on IAGs or, or public meetings um, where the we don't really move the needle at all. Um, so to me, where I think we can be most effective in, in our preservation work is where they're breaking down the information process. So right now, when you file a project, you have to file this huge report of information. And at that point, they're already invested in their project. They've got drawings, they've got renderings, they've done studies, you know, changing course at that point is not likely. Um, and if we wanna see them, for example, reuse a building, you know, upgrade it, add additions, whatever, instead of tearing it down, that feedback they have to get very clearly before they've done all of that. So I think the way that they're proposing, and I don't know all the details, but to re uh, require information, certain pieces of information at different points so that the, the community or the cat or whatever can give, can give feedback on smaller, bits if mm -hmm. that makes any sense so they if they came to the cat or the community or however the process is going to work and said we're thinking of tearing this building down and building something bigger and we could say we don't like that idea please invest some energy into how can we reuse this building or add on to it then they're more willing to engage in that conversation because they haven't invested all their resources otherwise so i'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to see us advocate there like yes i think the iags need to reform the cats are an interesting idea let's you know process that a little bit more but really i think where we're going to see the most effective outcomes is how to is how we can plug feedback in before they've invested a lot of energy into coming up with their project plan and that is going to happen by breaking down that requirement that pnf requirement into smaller pieces so that's where i'm really interested to hear more what what they're planning what information they're planning planning to require at what stage yeah i like that i know in this committee we've talked about you know asking for something similar to like a section 106 review process right before they get to sort of planning out right the extent the extent of the of the overall development um so we can actually see you know or or survey or you know something like that so that is the initial phase where we can say okay what is there now what do we want to reuse and then go from there, right? And, and exactly. And even if it's not a physical thing, maybe the building itself is not something we care about, but we care about the um, setback or, mm -hmm. you know, heritage trees or canopy. We care about um, materiality. We, it has a porch or a stoop or, you know, whatever it is that we care about that we want to see reflected in the new design, they should start with what's there. And yeah. we should have an analysis of how, what are the positive aspects of what's there? How does it impact culture and community? 
um, what intangible uh, aspects of that of that place or space are meaningful, and then design around that, um, yeah. which is what design vision really focused on. So if they're successful in incorporating design vision into the article 80 and these other planning processes, I, I think we'll see that. But I think that's something we should, this group should be pushing for is just what you said, start with what's there, do that analysis first, and um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, I could see that being an impactful change, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think that's great. All right, cool. Are we, do we, are we ready to talk about the six month report? Okay, I will read the ordinance. Um, let's see where it is. Okay, it says here, blah, blah, blah. All right, so, it says the commission will meet quarterly, blah, 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 that important. The commission will file a biannual, um, every six months report with the clerk to update the city and community on their progress. Um, any plans, timelines, and proposals presented by the commission to the clerk may be adjusted and refined by vote of the commission over the course of its existence. Um, so that's a a thing that's required by the ordinance, this uh, six month report. Um, it's very vague, uh, but I think it's a good opportunity for us to discuss. Uh, we have considered um, the struggles that we're, we're coming up against and anything else that we might need to put in there um, and then share that out, not just with the city clerk, but with um, relevant departments in the city that need to know that we are doing things that have thing that might overlap with them. Um, so I just wanted to get you guys, I wanted to have your opinion um, on, on this report and then get ideas and, and thoughts and just get the ball on you guys. Okay. I should start with if there's anything that you guys want, absolutely want, 100% need for there to be included in the report. I'm sorry, just so I'm clear, are we talking about we're reporting out on what we've done so far or we're reporting out on what our ultimate goals are for the group? Um, so it just says we will file a biannual progress report to update on our progress. Um, that's it. That's all it says. Um, but I'm also, you know, people are asking for separately, other people in other departments want to know what we're up to and what we need. So I figured I would use that report, since it's big enough, it's a sentence, um, to update, but also discuss like the problems we've run into and the things that we think we need, because that is a, that is an update. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think... You know, we can go through our minutes and, you know, Lydia and I as co-chairs can, not to volunteer you, Lydia, but we can help um, pull out some bullets of the conversations we've had about our lady, our five, et cetera, just to give some high level um, highlights on, on what we've discussed so far. Mm -hmm. But I think more importantly is what we want this group um, to accomplish, like what are our deliverables and where do we want to be able to weigh in? We've had some guest speakers, we can include that. I do think it would be helpful to kind of frame these discussions, you know, in terms of goals, even if the goals are are kind of fuzzy right now, but yeah. <laughs> like, you know, build historic preservation into Article 80, um, you know, improve or replace Article 85, we should probably include commissioner appointments, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in my mind, Lynn, there's there's two things happening at once. We've been talking about having formal recommendations from this group for things like Article 85. How do we want to see things change? But at the same time, things are changing, like Article 80. So we're mm -hmm. trying to weigh in and give feedback in current conversations about processes that are undergoing change. Um, and, and be relevant and timely as these things are happening in real time. Yeah, I mean, I figured, of course, there will be things that I can include, like 
based on the ordinance, this is what we've discussed and go through the um go through all of the meeting minutes, but I did want, you know, um things that might not be in those meeting minutes, like what you said in the about um commission appointments and article eight is a big one. it's not in our ordinance, but it's something that we are now discussing. Yeah, John Luke. Yeah, just a suggestion. Maybe we um you know, with with Article eighty, with Article eighty five, like there's definitely um the things that we're that we're doing, conversations that we're having to make progress on that. But I think also if we take a step back into sort of the thematic um areas level and just kind of like start kind of getting a grasp on like what exactly it is that we're trying to make progress on because these two pieces of legislation are just two tools and then we're we have like a a whole six year journey ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can just kind of like get get more of a higher level and then, you know, see where where these tools fit within that that toolkit. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. I, I also agree with um having some of you know, including some of the goals we've discussed, because I feel like we're just in some ways getting just getting started. Mm -hmm. um, so it at least even though, you know, we don't have a lot to report on, you know, it shows a little bit like where we're th what our thinking is or where we're going. I think two of the more immediate goals and deliverables would be this bulleted feedback for Article 80 that we're, that we're talking, we talked about earlier. And then uh, a more, in my mind, a more formal recommendation for Article 85, which we should get to as soon as possible because that impacts Article 80 and everything else. Um, what are other outcomes we know we wanna have from this group, short-term and long-term? Based on the ordinance, I know a long-term goal is, is gonna be the historic building survey or historic resource survey, I should say historic and cultural resource survey that we have not necessarily discussed, but I will put it in there because it's part of the ordinance and it is a goal. Um, and other things, it's suggesting adjustments to better align funds from the Community Preservation Trust, which I don't, I don't know that we have had that conversation at all. Um, so maybe that's something that, you know, I just met with because uh, Maureen retired um, as a collector treasurer, so I don't they don't have that person yet. But I just met with their team up to see who will be taking over that role, and so it might be it might be worth talking to them, for them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then it just says other policy changes for a comprehensive, equitable, um, is our preservation process. That's just the way it is. Um, but yeah. Do you know anything else about that trust? Um, I, I don't. I mean, I know like we've talked. I've talked to um the the people who run the the preservation like the fund. The why am I blanking on this? Um, the office and they, I also brought them in January to the the first commission meeting. Uh, and they talked about what they can fund and what they can't fund. Um, it's, it's just the community preservation people, the uh, team, uh, the community preservation act. Thank you. Yeah. That, that. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. I was like, I don't know. Trust you. I know. I'm, I'm like all over the place. Yeah. So the, the CPA, yeah, that's CPA. Yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. I've talked to the CPA office about about that stuff, but Community Re Preservation Trust, I assume they, they help, um, that office helps oversee it in some capacity. So um, it might be worth having them back for another conversation because they told us what they can do and what they can't do. But if we're supposed to recommend changes to that process, I think that's something we need to talk about and what that would look like and what that means even. Um, so um, one thing I do know about that is that there's been a lot of concern that that parks and recreation, for instance, has a huge voice at the table in terms of getting CPA funds. They're well organized, and preservation has not been. I'm not sure how you make that happen, but well, okay. I know Lynn that they have um, 
Jillian Lang is, is a preservation staff member, and I think they're hiring another full-time staff member because Courtney was contract or something. Right. Mm -hmm. So part of me was like relying on them to be the preservation advocates, but um, I don't know if, if all OHP staff had have or have had any presence on those meetings. Um, that's something we, I mean, I, they're now missing two of their leadership positions, but we could talk more with them about that or if they need more community members to be at those. I know those meetings are incredibly long and tedious, mm -hmm. so a lot mm -hmm. to ask someone to sit through, you know, six hours of meetings. Um, but I, I do think that we should take a deeper dive into what's been funded and being funded and considerations. I know there's, I've had some concerns expressed to me about um, private property getting funding when it's it's only supposed to be public and publicly accessible property. So I, yeah, it's, it's probably time for us to have a regroup on that and make sure that preservation is getting its fair share and that it's going to the, the best possible projects. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a, their, their slideshow, they sent me a long time ago and they're saying there's, limited and narrowly defined by the CPA, which is just to acquire, create, preserve, and support community housing, acquire, create, preserve open space, rehabilitate and restore open space um, that was created or acquired with community preservation funds, acquire, create, preserve, rehabilitate, and restore land for recreational use, um, acquire, preserve, rehabilitate, and restore historic resources. Um, they cannot do any maintenance programming operations, no interior work, only exterior capital improvements, um no acquisition of artificial turf no, we don't need to know any of these things um but yeah so it seems pretty limited um they said that they could not fund historic trails for example um yeah and they have obviously affordable housing goals which they want to preserve naturally naturally occurring affordable housing so i think there's i think there's a conversation that needs to be started there i i think housing and well housing in particular is probably has the strongest voice but it's really it's more like a political political voice you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and not just staff people representing or even members representing preservation but um outside groups well then when it first got started i pushed hard for more of the allotment to go to preservation because there's already capital funding and a lot of other resources for affordable housing and open mm -hmm. space and there's nothing for historic preservation and that was not successful the the uh the messaging at the time was we're going to give as much as we can to affordable housing which i understand mm -hmm. um but so maybe our sort of our strategy here is to message more about where historic preservation and affordable housing overlap and try and get more projects um uh you know affordable housing within existing and historic buildings and and really push for that to get more of the money mm -hmm. Re reuse yeah mm -hmm. well it's interesting because i was just read something in the globe today about i think we all know how difficult it is to convert office towers <laughs> um but the, the one example that this article mentioned was an old building. You know, it, it was a ten or twelve story brick building. I forget where, but th those are the ones that are much easier to um, to convert. Yeah, exactly. The the study report or the study that the city did, um, I think it was Util that did it, found that it was the older buildings that were more successful for conversion for a number of reasons. And I know, so I'm on the board of the Legacy Fund for Boston, um, which is a granting body. It's new. We're in our first round of funding right now. And we offered to, to you know, consider contributing to the office conversion effort if there were if there was historic fabric that would otherwise be lost in a conversion. Um, could we help fund the restoration of it or something like that? So I think that there's opportunities to continue to work with the city and Elevate Historic Preservation Through Office Conversion. The ADU program is somewhere where I think this group could have a voice. Um, they're looking to expand the ADU program, and that is investing in existing fabric. Um, it, have you, you, guys, you guys worked with the ADU stuff at all? I don't know. If I'm getting... So it's additional dwelling units. And years ago, there was a pilot program um, to allow 
um, residential owners, let's say you owned uh, a house in Boston, you could put a unit in your basement or in your attic um, as additional income or for um, relatives to live, you know, age in place kind of a thing. But it was just for the existing footprint of that house, that building. So it didn't include outbuildings, carriage houses, or new additions. Now they're expanding it to include those things, which is great for historic preservation because it invests in that existing fabric, especially the carriage houses, which we were losing um, left and right by you know demolition by neglect. But now there's an incentive to invest in that carriage house because you can make money off of renting it out. So anyway, I think that's a place where preserva the preservation community in this group could be could be really supportive and say, this is a great program. We wanna see more investment in it. Same with office conversion. Um, and finding the dollars, I, you know, I think the Legacy Fund is a place we can look to fund as well as CPA, but we might have to branch out to other resources. Um, we've not been successful in getting the city to budget money for things like economic studies or citywide survey of historic resources or things like that. So uh, unless anyone thinks we're going to be more successful in the future with a city budget, we're going to have to get more creative. Yeah, hi. Um, I absolutely think the city should have a line item budgets for historic preservation. I mean, there's no reason, there's no legislative regulatory reason why not. Um, it seems entirely appropriate for all kinds of reasons. And with you know, Murray on board now that, you know, giving Mar Murray some money, he's talked about doing pilot projects, you know, sort of demonstration projects in neighborhoods, which is a really smart idea. So I, I'd definitely not concede all the... Councilor Bach made this point. Oh, there's never going to be any money in the budget. <laughs> I don't know why. So let's just keep, I would not take that off the table. Well, I, I think you should share. Murray Miller has resigned, so he's no longer with the. Oh my gosh. The when did that happen? Uh, oh, last when week? did that happen? Yeah, last week. And his, his final day will be the 19th. Oh my so, God. Well, that's a message right there, I guess. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, but, but I mean, I completely agree with you that the, the city's budget should have capital money for historic preservation. It should be investing in the studies and the resources and the staffing that we need, um, but they haven't in the past. And I don't know whether that's a feeling on like my organization as advocates or internally there's not enough advocacy or someone asking for it or pushing for it, or there's just simply not enough money to go around and they don't see it as a priority. Um, so that's an effort that we, this group and, and us as advocates could make in preservation community. Or like I said, we could look for outside resources to help fund the things that we feel like are necessary. Mm -hmm. okay. um, well, let me ask else? Tennessee, before we move on from budget questions, sorry. No, this is all we have. <laughs> all right. Is there any money coming or available for the Commemoration Commission? Um, so good question. I mean, I hope. Um, so I, I know that they the budget office is asking about, um, you know, f requests for funding for the commission and its subcommittees. So, um, I'm hoping that that is something that may be coming for OHP. Um, I know that tourism, sports, entertainment slash, um, economic opportunity also is thinking about about it because any event that they put on for 250 is in some way commemoration commission inclined um so i i don't know what they're doing there but i know that they are thinking about about it um and i do know that the question has been posed well then we need to be ready to, to have a line item request this is the money that this committee needs yeah. And, and know exactly what we want to use that money for. Yeah, exactly. Um, Which is why I'm going to, I'm going to create a list. You guys want to review that. Um, I'm more than, happy, more than happy to send that over. Um, You know, for line items, things that, that at the very least the ordinance um, identifies as something that would eventually need money, like a survey. Um, so, Can we yeah. be more proactive about that? If, if we had a few things or, or one big priority or whatever that we wanted funded and we know how much we want we need for it, can we like proactively say, hey, we want this money? Yes, I, I think that's kind of the expectation at this point. 
So what do we, if we had to pick one or two big things we wanted money for, what do, what do we want? And that might go back to Allison's question in the chat about can CPA fund historic survey. Um, so we can talk about that. Like it is, if that's what we want, or just either some, we've always, the preservation community has always wanted to fund economic studies to show, put hard numbers behind why historic preservation is good for local economy. Um, I mean, we know anecdotally, we know from research, and other cities, but we don't have Boston numbers. I think that would be really helpful to show how it increases jobs, increases affordability, increases nightlife and artists. And I mean, all the things we've seen from reports from other cities, I, I am confident are true for Boston, but we don't, we've, nobody's studied it here. So I'd love to fund that, but that's gonna be that uh, 50 grand. Yeah, I mean, I think if we have, maybe three, anywhere from one to three, or I don't know that we should limit ourselves, but at least, at least one to three um, things that we wanna wanna produce, I think that'd be great. Um, yeah. So to Allison's question about can CPA fund the historic survey, I'll share what I know, and then I don't know if anybody else knows differently, but, um, when CPA first started, there was, there's something like, I don't know, there's some percentage of money, I can't remember if it's five, 15, set, set aside for admin. Mm -hmm. um, and we were hoping to use part of that admin money to hire a consultant to prepare for a citywide survey. Not actually do the survey, but pre prepare it, get it ready. Because if we're gonna work with, um, as a certified local government, we have some requirements to work with MHC, Massachusetts Historical Commission, they have their own process, their own survey forms. So it's a, it's a little bit tricky of how to do that. But there was talk at the very beginning that that's how that would function. I don't know why it never went anywhere. Those funds were never utilized for that purpose. And this the citywide historic survey, survey has not gone anywhere. We have, and it'll, it'll be multi-million dollars. It'll be a multi-year project. Um, so it's not something CPA probably would fund in its entirety, but it could fund beginning stage potentially. We did talk, I think, with this group with, with Chief White Hammond when she was here, that there was some talk internally of combining um, things into one survey. So tree canopy, public art, whatever, all into one survey <laughs> that it was more likely to get that funded than a survey for just historic properties. Meanwhile, I know that MHC with OHP continues to do single neighborhood surveys and try and fill in where we have gaps and update surveys. I know Plan Downtown is doing some form of historic character study. It's not a formal survey. Um, and I think some neighborhoods are sort of taking it upon themselves to do some survey work. So right now we're very hodgepodgey. Um, the squares and streets, they're doing a little bit of, of um, sort of crowdsourced cultural heritage survey work. It's not what I would consider a, a survey. So we're very all over the place. And it would be great if we could do something that's more comprehensive um, across the entire city. So it's all on on one database. Um, so I don't know if that's, in, if anybody knows anything differently or that answers the question, but that's where we're at as far as I know. No, that's, that's similar to what they told me as well, 5%. Um, and it's it, with that 5% also pays for um, all of their admin stuff, obviously. Um, so it's a little bit tricky, um, trickier than it seems. Um, so Lydia, in terms of your question, the implications of his departure, I mean, I hope, I hope the impact is minimal. When I um, I just met with the chief, and the the goal was to try to minimize any impact um, from his of his departure by uh, setting up open open communication lines between me and the interim BLC executive director and interim uh, director of OHP. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's it's hard to say what exactly are the implications of her departure. Are they, do you know, planning to fill both of those positions? Then are they gonna change them, combine them or leave no, them as they? they are planning to fill both. They um 
aren't sure if they will try to fill one over the other, before the other or if they will just release you know both job postings at the same time um obviously they want to do that as soon as possible uh if there are uh changes to those roles they will probably be working on them i don't know if they're going to be main major changes um i think they're more internal in the way that they support staff members um but i think that the function that they play for for residents and for um other other external sources won't change uh too much okay i i do know that the job description has been written for the executive director yes. now it that was to release they, unless they decide to rethink it in terms of now there are two jobs. Yes, and it was it was written. It was not agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Like it's not it's not in its final form in yeah. any in any way. Um, <laughs> soon maybe. <laughs> um, but I I think that so yeah. Um, hopefully that that's something that they get a move on because it's it is a bit of a setback for us. Uh, I shouldn't say it, but it's a it's a setback for sure. Is there anything this group can do to help advocate for anything in particular? Um, I mean, this is why we're we're doing the report, you know, so that we can advocate for as much as possible. Um, you know, maybe I'll advocate myself another another staff member. <laughs> um, and you know, I hope I mean it's hard to say like the report will fix everything because but the hope is that it's it's thorough enough and it's I don't know hitting enough hard hitting enough that it it, it really conveys exactly what's ne what's needed the issues that we've been having and the urgency with which we need these things. Yeah, it it can't be timid. No, not at all. It yeah. cannot be timid. No, I've been it, timid. I think it's a preservation community. I think it's past due time for us to make some demands. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't plan to be timid. It's not who I am. So. <laughs> you should say. Yeah. Um. Okay. Is if there's anything else, you know, let us know. Let me know. Final comments. If not. Well, here in the chat, in a, a demonstration project money, I'd love to hear more about that idea. Is there a specific project in Hyde Park or or somewhere that you had in mind? Yeah, I can talk to that if if the. It's okay with the yeah. Genesis? Yeah, of course. Cool. So this is something that, that Marie, that Mr. Miller did mention, gem demonstration projects, pilot projects. And I think they dovetail with surveys. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm speaking strictly of neighborhoods. I know there's a whole different, in some sense, different for the inner, inner urban core, but um, people get attached to properties. They in terms of urban fabric and neighborhood identity. And oftentimes they're not listed or they're just in the macros database, hours. macros database, you know, they're not like landmark protected. And for a long time, the local thing was a, was a hurdle for that. But in any event, what we found when we were working with, with Roseanne, she said, I'd love to help you, but number one, I don't have any money. And number two, I don't have documentation. So, we would say, yeah, give us documentation. And she's, well, why don't I have money for documentation? CPA does do every year uh, per um, per gillion. They pick out one or two uh, site building assessment fund. You know, they, they're not, it's not bricks and mortar improvements. It's actual, you know, surveys. Um, so having a fund available for every year, let's just say, six or eight property evaluations. And we can anticipate they would be private property for the most part. It obviously have to be a, a an owner that was open to it, which we know sometimes is an issue too. Um, but we say I, the pitch that we've been making to folks is, hey, you know, let's do the let's do the survey. So at least you know the structural issues for your site, for your building. And then we can help you with funding for rehabilitation, site stabilization, you know, roofs, windows, the usual first things, foundations, heating systems, et cetera, and then have some money set aside for that. 
as we know, CPA has sort of evolved into an exterior of churches program. I know that's very broad brush, but um, somehow linking discretionary funding within the Office of Historic Preservation together with these philanthropic sources like Legacy Fund, which is really fantastic, um, I think is the way to go because then you can build some success stories with a constituency for, hey, we did this, we rehabbed the building, we adaptively reused, we protected the embedded carbon, we now have ideally, you know, some housing, affordable housing, avoided displacement, et cetera. So you can kind of do a back of the envelope budget for something like that. Each historic surveys probably cost $10,000 just to pick a number. You do five, that, that's what, $50,000. And then a really decent initial rehab is going to cost half a million. So you do, you do that. So you're talking like $4 million, $5 million. That's not a lot of, in the, in the grand scheme of things of the city's budget, that's not a lot of money. Um, so that's okay. kind of the back of the envelope take on it all. I think that's interesting. We tried, we ran some numbers. We tried to find comparable projects that were rehab of existing buildings for housing versus demo and new construction of about the same size and unit count. And the new building was always more expensive than the right. rehab and the samples right. that we found. So I'd love, I think it'd be really interesting to do a demonstration project where we took a residential project, added, you know, an addition onto the back, did some upgrades, um, and did a, did a side by side comparison. This is what a developer would have done through demo and new construction. This is what we did through preservation, and this and and this is what would have gone to a landfill, and this is what didn't. This is what we would have lost in trees and open space versus what we didn't, and be able to really lay that out for people. I mean, we could do it with existing project you know, go backwards um but I, I think it could be really compelling to do it in real time i agree i think it's very doable i think the timing feels right and it goes to the point too of sort of where historic considerations enter into the development process um some of it is just the ethos of the city right if if, if developers know hey if they show up at the ninth floor and they're proposing demolitioning a building they're going to get a little bit of a question mark as opposed to that's fine at the end of it by the way you have to go to the landmarks commission it's a very different thing right but case studies with metrics very very useful for sure when i think that predictability component is critical they need to know that they're going to get pushback from the bpda and bcdc ohp and the community if they propose demolition of a building that could be successfully rehabbed so it, it needs to be something that's not only an expectation, but it's a requirement in Article 80 to, to show that, um, to show that you've considered it and what the outcomes would be, one versus you know all new construction. So that, that's why I'm trying to advocate in both places. And I think we've seen some traction internally at the BPA. I, I've heard from architects and members of my board and others that they are getting more pushback from, from BPDA staff when they propose you know a demo. So, but I think we should keep pushing on that. And I, I think a demonstration project's a really interesting idea. Anything else? Yeah. Um. One one thing that I've been uh, one thing that I've been rolling in my head. Um. During this conversation is just sort of like um, what are the the intersections between um between between this group and the, and the larger um commission and um the reparations task force. Um, because of the fact that it seems that while we're while we're talking about like either rehab rehabbing a building or reusing materials, uh, what really comes up as a as a question for me um, is how is that value uh, being retained by the community, whether it's the building itself, whether it's like the materials or like the art that's in the building or something like that. Um, how do we um, how do we make sure that the value stays within specific communities? Uh, and then also like how do you know perhaps there's like ways in which the action steps towards um, uh, that I'm not sure exactly if the reparations commission has like done its full final report yet. I'm, I'm kind of looking at what embrace put out. Uh, I see that the 
the commission itself hasn't had a um a meeting since March. So I'm not necessarily sure where they're at in their process, but perhaps there's like some things that actually dovetail uh, into the conversations that we're having here within this group. That's a good That's point. A good point. I, I know when we were looking at those numbers, the you know, the cost of new construction that gets passed down to the the buyer or the tenant, right? So if we're saving money that savings gets passed down. Um, so that's that's something to think, I mean, that's why we're advocating for it. But I think a lot of times um, I'm, I'm guilty of focusing too much on the built environment and tangible history, not enough on culture and intangible history. So maybe we should a little bit more thought into um, why these places matter and how we're advocating for, for art and culture and the intangible aspects of place, um, which I know, Lydia, I think you've been working on in Chinatown, haven't you? Yeah, and it's really hard to um, define. So I'm thinking, you know, like when we talked about the funding, the historic survey, I wonder if one of the things we could work on as a task force is um, kind of like talking about like what are the types of historic assets um, that we would want surveyed. So it's not just buildings um, and yeah. And maybe that could like help to um, shape the, some of that conversation. Yeah, because it's also signage or wayfinding. It's also uh, open space where we have events and cultural experiences it's space for, I know we talked in design vision, where places where the community gather um, by default, if there's no designated space, they're going to put, have a cookout or a community gathering or yard sale, or whatever, in whatever space they can find. So how do we make sure that, that we are preserving or creating those spaces for those cultural interactions as part of the work that we're doing? Final thoughts. We have a lot. We have a lot to do. I think. <laughs> um, but but this was actually really helpful in terms of thinking through how we might frame the report to talk about to really think through um, what the what this subcommittee what the commission is actually trying to to accomplish and trying to produce and the themes that that tie ties together. So. If not, do we want to ask anybody want to start a, a motion to adjourn? Motion. Oh. One more comment. Second. Second. Thank you, guys. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, Hennessy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Hennessy. Oh.